Following the abolition of slavery in the United States, white slave owners were compensated for the emancipation of their slaves. Black people were treated as commodities and properties, prompting concerns about potential losses to the slave owners. Consequently, President Abraham Lincoln enacted the Compensated Emancipation Act. With this act, an average of $300 was provided to each slave owner for the liberation of their black slaves. However, this compensation failed to acknowledge the horrors and brutality endured by the black community during over two and a half centuries of subjugation. Despite serving as the backbone of the American economy and playing a critical role in infrastructure development, black slaves were not compensated monetarily, surviving on meager food rations alone. It becomes essential for the U.S. to make reparations to the descendants of black Americans who endured unimaginable suffering. This issue has long been neglected, obscured by complexity, and dismissed as groundless. But this can no longer be the case. In this video, we will tell you how the U.S. has to pay reparation to the descendants of black Americans who endured atrocities during slavery. Various reports and surveys have been done to calculate how much should be paid to each black American, which you will know about in this video. Let's get started. The Black History Archives Slavery in the United States was a dehumanizing institution that treated Africans and African Americans as tradable commodities. Over 600,000 enslaved individuals were forcibly brought to the U.S., constituting 5% of the 12 million Africans captured during the transatlantic slave trade that began in 1526. During the early colonial era, Britain's colonies, including the future 13 U.S. colonies, actively practiced slavery. Africans were forcefully taken and subjected to harsh labor on American soil, contributing to the cultivation of crops such as tobacco and cotton. Over time, millions of black slaves were legally considered property, enduring brutal treatment and exploitation as a source of unpaid labor. Their contributions played a pivotal role in establishing the U.S. as a dominant global economy with enslaved individuals collectively valued at around $3.5 billion by 1860, making them the most valuable asset in the entire U.S. economy, equivalent to approximately $115 billion today. In the antebellum South, black slaves made up about 13% of the Southern population. Many resided on large plantations or small farms, with some slaveholders owning 50 enslaved individuals. As the 18th century drew to a close, the exhausted land used for tobacco farming triggered an economic crisis in the southern United States. With the nation expanding westward and the abolitionist movement gaining momentum, the future of slavery became increasingly uncertain. This uncertainty fueled a contentious national discourse on slavery, ultimately leading to the seismic upheaval of the Civil War. Despite their substantial contributions to the nation's wealth through forced labor, Black Americans did not reap any benefits for themselves. Interestingly, the U.S. government acknowledged the necessity of reparations during that period and issued an order to allocate 40 acres of land and a mule to all formerly enslaved families, offering them an opportunity to build wealth and financial stability. However, following the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, President Andrew Johnson adopted a different stance revoking Field Order 15 and choosing to return the land to former slave owners instead of providing black individuals with the means to support themselves. This decision manifested the injustice rooted in the very fabric of the United States, highlighting racism and the legacy of slavery. The federal government effectively empowered those who had once enslaved black Americans, compensating slave owners in Washington, D.C., and neighboring states for the loss of property represented by the freed individuals. This practice was prevalent across various states. It is worth noting that not only did slave owners profit from the exploitation of black Americans, but they also generated additional income from the labor of the formerly enslaved individuals who had no choice but to work the land. Despite gaining their freedom, black Americans were left without any form of wealth or sustainable means of livelihood marking the genesis of the enduring wealth gap. In the aftermath of the American Civil War, state governments in the former Confederate states implemented measures to curtail the voting rights of black citizens and enforce racial segregation. To achieve these goals, 
They introduced black codes and Jim Crow laws across the Southern United States. From that point until the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, not only were discrimination and segregation legally sanctioned, but they were also actively enforced. African Americans face social, economic, and legal discrimination, experiencing segregated facilities in theaters, hotels, and restaurants, and sometimes outright denial of service. Before the 20th century, many African Americans owned homes, farmland, and urban properties. Notably, Tulsa was home to a flourishing Black Wall Street, characterized by a predominantly prosperous Black community. However, as Black wealth grew, so did the prejudice, hostility, and envy of some white individuals. To hinder the expansion of Black wealth, both the government and supremacist white Americans took significant measures to undermine it. As the prosperity of black individuals and their property ownership increased, envious white individuals resorted to violence and brutal acts to uphold the tenets of white supremacy. Organizations like the Tuskegee Institute and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People documented over 3,000 lynchings that occurred between 1865 and 1965. Here's a reminder to please support us so we can make more videos for you by subscribing to our channel and giving the video a like. We want to build a strong community and we need your support. Let's continue now. Many of the victims were landowners and the objective was to eliminate black wealth, seize black owned land and perpetuate white supremacy. Notably, some white officials actively endorsed and supported this violence. Initially, these lynchings primarily targeted individual families, but in some cases, entire black communities faced devastation. Two notable instances include the forced removal of Forsyth County, Georgia, in 1912, and the tragic destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1921. Black landowners faced immense pressure from authorities and fellow citizens to abandon their land, effectively becoming refugees in their own country. The significant wealth gap between African Americans and white individuals today can be attributed primarily to these federal housing policies implemented throughout the 20th century. While African-American incomes, on average, amount to roughly 60% of the average white incomes, African-American wealth represents only 5% of white wealth. In the United States, the wealth of most middle-class families is primarily derived from the equity they hold in their homes. Therefore, the notable gap between the 60% income ratio and the 5% wealth ratio can be primarily attributed to these federal housing policies. African-American families, prohibited from purchasing homes in suburban areas during the 1940s, 50s, and even into the 60s due to FHA policies, were denied the opportunity to benefit from the equity appreciation experienced by white families. When the Fair Housing Act was finally enacted in 1968, allowing African Americans to purchase homes in the suburbs, it had already become financially unattainable for many black families. Meanwhile, white families continued to acquire these homes, reaping the benefits of equity and the subsequent accumulation of wealth. White families used their home equity to finance their children's college education and support their elderly parents, achieving financial independence without depending on their descendants. This is where the concept of reparations enters the discussion. Reparations, as a means of addressing the historical injustices endured by Black Americans, are not a new idea. They have been the subject of debate, advocacy, and legislative proposals for many years. One prominent example is the H.R. 40 bill, which has been introduced in various sessions of Congress since 1989 officially titled the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act. The bill outlines its purpose. It aims to establish a commission tasked with examining the enduring impacts of slavery and discrimination in formulating potential solutions in the form of reparations. Despite multiple introductions, the H.R. 40 bill has yet to advance into law. Yet, the topic of reparations is a subject of considerable debate. Some argue that reparations may not effectively address the difficulties of historical injustices and suggest that alternative approaches, such as investments in education, healthcare, and economic opportunities, could have a more profound impact. Critics of reparations express concerns that it could further polarize the nation and raise questions about eligibility. 
whether all black Americans should receive compensation or only descendants of those who can trace their lineage back to slavery. Additionally, they question the idea of taxpayers funding reparations, arguing that no one alive today bears responsibility for historical injustices like slavery. However, economist William Darity, co-author of the book, From Here to Equality, which presents a comprehensive plan for material reparations, firmly believes that targeted reparations to close the racial wealth gap represent the most effective strategy for addressing historical and current wealth disparities within America. According to Darity's calculations, achieving this objective would require an expenditure of approximately $350,000 per eligible recipient. Under Darity's proposal, direct payments would be dispersed to an estimated 47 million Americans who identify as black. To qualify, individuals would need to have identified as black, Negro, African American, or Afro American for at least 12 years before the reparations plan takes effect. They would also be required to provide evidence of at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. One method for establishing this ancestry is through census records. However, Practical steps toward reparations have yet to be taken by the U.S. government and the state. The Black American community is entitled to reparations as citizens of the United States, and it is their right to receive it. Despite detailed proposals being presented, various administrations have merely touched on the issue without taking concrete action. A study in the Review of Black Political Economy suggests that considering all factors related to slavery, the U.S. owes approximately $151 million to every black American, highlighting why the U.S. has avoided this topic. Even if $151 million is not paid, at least $350,000 should be allocated to every black American. But who will pay the reparation money? Initially, there was a suggestion that the federal government should shoulder the responsibility for reparations. The argument here is that the federal government bears a significant responsibility for the institution of slavery, as it was rooted in federal law and protected by the Constitution. Therefore, establishing a dedicated fund for reparations is seen as a necessary step. Some proposals advocate for corporations that have historical ties to slavery or have profited from it to contribute to the reparations fund. This may contain corporations rooted in industries like banking, insurance, or cotton production which had direct connections to slavery. Among these proposals, the argument that those who inherited the wealth and land amassed by slave owners should compensate the descendants of former slaves appears more practical. Those who have inherited wealth and land acquired through the exploitation of enslaved people bear a moral and legal responsibility to address this historical injustice. If it is argued that the descendants of former slaves should not receive reparations because they did not endure brutalities, then the descendants of white supremacist slave owners should also not hold the wealth generated from slavery. In such a scenario, this wealth should be renounced. Legally and ethically, this wealth undoubtedly belongs to the descendants of slaves who continue to face structural and systemic racism. Isn't it true that paying slavery reparation to black Americans is not only a legal obligation, but a moral one as well? Do you think America will pay reparation, or will it get rid of this like other things related to black Americans? Speak out and let us know your thoughts on whether you support reparation or not. Would you like us to make more videos? If yes, please support us by subscribing to the Black History Archives and clicking the bell icon. You can check out more videos on our channel too.